Welcome to The Sword and the Trowel. The Sword and the Trowel is a podcast of Founders Ministries. And Founders exists for the recovery of the gospel and reformation of local churches. I am Tom Askell, the president of Founders Ministries, and here with... Graham Gundon. Graham Gundon. And Graham is assistant pastor at Grace Baptist Church with me here at uh, Cape Coral, Florida. We're delighted to be together. And uh, today we also have a special guest we'll introduce in just a moment all the way from Alberta, Canada. But first of all, we have a few things to announce in terms of some sales going on and the uh, conference coming up in January 2022. So Graham, tell us about what's available for those that are going to purchase items from founders this week. Yeah, any order that's placed within the next week will get a free mystery item along with their order. Mm. That'll either be a mug, or a book or a Tesla <laughs> plaid. Um, n- not, not really the Tesla. It could be. I mean, you know, or as long as you use the word or in there. Yeah, right? you never you never know. Never and, know. And, and three, um, I, I would say lucky, but providentially <laughs> blessed customers will get this Founders Ministries tumbler. Wow. This is uh, made out of col- cobalt and <laughs> and uh, titanium. No, I'm kidding. It's not. But it's a it's a great uh, tumbler. So how do three, I get one of those? All I have to do is order books. You got to order a book, and if but, you know, we get these things at Founders, and I hear about them on these podcasts. Mm-hmm. Like you know, this this tumbler would be nice to have if I only had connections. I saw somebody with one, yeah. and so I knew to ask about it, but I still don't have <laughs> okay. one. Okay, all right. So just any book. I mean, any order is any that right? order. Yeah, any order this week until the end of this week, which will be what the twenty fourth, fifth. 25th of October, anything before the 25th of October, 2021, uh, you order from founders and you get a free mystery item, Mm -hmm. including the possibility of that really cool, um, it's not a mug. What is Tumblr. it? Tumblr. Tumblr. Thank you so much. Well, we're delighted to have James Coates with us uh, from Alberta. James has been with us before, and he's going to be one of the speakers at our upcoming conference in January, January 20 through 22, uh, the conference is Militant and Triumphant, The Doctrine of the Church. James will be joining Tom Buck and Vody Balkum, Conrad and Bayway, uh, Travis Allen, as well as me for address in addressing this theme in sunny Florida, southwest Florida in the middle of the winter, which is a great place to be. So James, welcome all the way from Alberta. What's the temperature there today? You know what? I haven't even checked yet, but it's it's probably somewhere around um, 32 Fahrenheit, I would venture to 32. say. 32, wow. yeah, that's what, about uh, 40 degrees higher or lower than yeah. what we are, right? Yeah, yeah, so we're probably, around 70. Well, 70. well I, I did that for you guys on purpose, so we're about zero Celsius, and that's about <laughs> 32 Fahrenheit, if I'm if I'm correct. That yeah. is correct. Yeah, I don't understand Celsius, so thank you that. for translating this for us dumb Americans down here. So, James, welcome. Man, we have prayed for you. Folks uh, here are very familiar with you and the faithfulness of the church and your ministry and the challenges y'all went through in April. So just give us a little update. I mean, you spent a month in jail because of your determination to keep the church open and to preach the gospel when governmental officials were saying, no, 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 you can't do that. And we're not going to let you do that. So just give us an update. How are you and your family doing? How's the church doing? How's the ministry going? Yeah, we're doing well. Our our province opened up on July 1st and was open all the way until I think sometime in uh, September. And then we entered back into another health emergency with the fourth wave, the Delta mm-hmm. variant mm-hmm. and, uh, and numbers, um, for cases and such, I think have peaked and are, are starting to plateau a little bit. And, and the government has taken a bit less of an aggressive enforcement stance at this time. And so we're continuing to meet at this point and, uh, and not really sure what their intention is with respect to how they're going to uh, deal with us. Mm-hmm. And, uh, but nevertheless, we're, we're committed to coming together each Sunday and, and worshiping our Lord and savior, Jesus Christ, uh, ministering to one another, uh, experiencing and, 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 and being impacted by the means of grace. And so we've, uh, we've been, we've been meeting. We're now in two services. We, mm. we just got too big for one. Mm. I mean, we were, uh, from from you know when we got back into our facility on July first, um, all the way until um, I think sometime maybe early October or late September, uh, we were running a single service and we had uh, folks in in chairs in the foyer. We had folks 
uh, on the second level in the library. We had a tent outside where people were getting audio video and, and it just got to be unlivable. And so we're now in two services. We're probably on a Sunday averaging about 700 total at this point. Mm. And, um, and we just see new people all the time. I mean, people are coming to Grace Life all the time. We've got uh, people that are, are, are being saved through our ministry mm. and, and they're, they're showing up. Um, we've got people who are, are coming to Christ and then finding us um, really just an amazing time. Mm. I have more conversations on Sunday with either individuals who are unbelievers and, and, and their evangelistic conversations or their new believers and, and, and literally like the, you know, the, the foliage is just starting to sprout above mm. the, you know, the soil. And so um, just an amazing time for ministry. Uh, the, the preaching of the word at this time is just, uh, it's intense. Uh, we're in the gospel of John. It's uh, intensely relevant as the word of God always is. And so we're just uh, really blessed at this time and, and putting our hand to the plow and, and doing the work of the ministry. Family's doing well. Mm. And uh, we're just, yeah, everything's just moving on. Um, no we can look back at the last year that we've experienced and, you know, I can just say that I've seen the same providence of God that has been involved in my life since I came to Christ uh, be a reality over the last year. Uh, I would say that in every way we are better off for all that we've gone through uh, personally, corporately. And, um, and so you know, to God be the glory. He is faithful. He works all things after the counsel of his will. He works all things for the good of those who love him and are called according to his purpose. I have experienced that. And that's really strengthening because as you anticipate the possibility of, of future battles, I mean, that is a down payment on yeah. future faithfulness. So um, I'm encouraged. Um, I, uh, I, 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 by God's grace, am in a place of of courageousness as far as the future is concerned and uh, i'm here to, to spend my life for the glory of god and the glory of christ amen so uh i mean that's exciting it's encouraging to hear because oftentimes people look at the prospect of the things you guys were facing last spring and do so with fear and they think oh no you know what if well if we don't comply then you might go to jail. You know, my, my pastor might be arrested or my husband uh, might be taken from the family. And those would be miserable things. And certainly those weren't pleasant. And I'm sure Aaron and the church and everybody had to deal with all kinds of difficulties while you were away from them. But in and through it all, you can look back and have that testimony. That is a great encouragement. Tell us about, so how was the church? How's the church different today? than say two years ago or a year and a half ago, you know, in terms of your size, you were meeting in one uh, gathering, right? And then uh, what other things would you say have happened? If you were to take a snapshot 18 months ago and a snapshot yesterday, last Sunday, uh, what would be some of the obvious differences and things that have happened uh, from then to now? You know, I think that's a great question. I, I, um, I think we can say at this point in time, we've doubled in size. Mm. Uh, we can, it's a, it's literally a doubling in size as a result of this. So we're, we're a larger church for sure. Um, you know, but I don't know if a lot has changed. I mean, obviously we've got new folks and we're mm -hmm. trying to get to know those folks and our, our folks are trying to get to know them as well. And so there's, there's people that are coming into Grace Life Church and, and, and they need to, um, to embrace all that grace life is. Right. And, and so that's going to take some time as, uh, as they just learn what biblical ministry looks like, what it looks like to have a biblical leadership, shepherding, leading, you know, charting the direction, uh, what it looks like to have, you know, biblical ministries taking place in the context of the local church. And so, um, so things are going well. I mean, I, I, I can't, uh, I think our church, aside from the fact that it's grown, uh, doesn't look that different apart from the fact that there are new faces. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. Um, you know, the challenge we're, we're up against right now is that there's uh, a vaccine mandate that's in place uh, for a lot of, of, of workers. Mm -hmm. And so we've got people in our church who right now are either 
uh, on the cusp of losing their job or they have lost their job or they're trying to navigate different kinds of exemptions, whether medical or religious. And so we've got people who are under the, the gun, as it were, uh, with respect to the, the prospect of job loss. And so that's that's uh, where things are, are, are at for them. And so I would say at this point in time, in terms of the immediate pressure that our people are experiencing, that's it. Mm-hmm. And, uh, and so, you know, we, we got a lot of folks that just on principle and conscience do not want to receive the vaccine. And, um, you know, we haven't taken a, a stand where we would say that it's wrong and sinful black and white to get the vaccine. Some do feel that way. And just the fact that they feel that way just adds to my, you know, personal uh, discomfort with even the idea of receiving the vaccine. Um, but we got a lot of folks that just just don't want it and um and and are willing to lose their jobs to to avoid it and so um so yeah so that's that's the pressure that's on them right now and and so yeah i think with that comes all kinds of you know requests (laughs) and and shepherding and questions that would normally not be there and so i would say you know ministry in some ways is busier you know we're doing a membership class right now normally we would have you know, at most 25 people going through membership, we've got 60 going through membership right now. Our membership process is really involved. So we have to do uh, membership interviews for each person coming in. Mm -hmm. And and that's just a lot of interviews Mm -hmm. when you when you stack all those up, it's gonna take us weeks, if not months to get through these interviews. Uh, A number of people that are going to be baptized, I don't even know what the number is right now. uh, Just because I missed that class when I was at G3 in Atlanta. And, uh, and so we've got, I think in the double digits of folks that are mm-hmm. going to be baptized. And, and so there's just a lot going on. It's, it's a, it's a wonderful time to be alive <laughs> and to be doing the work of the ministry. Yeah. You know, we, uh, <clears throat> have just completed last week, our elders completed a, a document, a, a paper on the vaccine mandates or really any kind of medical mandates and providing for our membership, uh, those that want it, a statement saying that, yes, we can affirm there's a religious exemption that is appropriate for uh, this person to seek from his employer or a situation where it's being mandated. Graham, you did the heavy lifting on mm-hmm. that. And uh, let's take just a moment to talk through that, because we've heard from Christians whose elderships or pastors have told them, no, we will not write you a letter to say that you uh, have genuine religious grounds mm. not to succumb to this mandate. And um, that just seems strange to me. I can't imagine not, I can't imagine doing that or, or, or not providing uh, encouragement to people who have a genuine conscientious objection. So uh, give us some insights, Graham, the things you learned and what yeah. you did. Yeah, you know, that that stance, uh, religious leaders taking that stance, it's, it's almost like, um, the, if the government were to mandate that everyone take a, a drink a glass of wine every Friday, mm-hmm. but you have Christians in your congregation who are convinced that if they take if they drink alcohol, that's sin. Um, and the elders say, well, the Bible doesn't say anywhere that you can't drink mm-hmm. alcohol. So therefore you have to do that. You have no you cannot have no religious exemption. Mm-hmm. Um, but if they're convinced <laughs> it's sin, if they can't drink that glass of wine in faith, then for them it is sin. Mm-hmm. And so it just seems so short-sighted for pastors, elders, religious leaders to be saying that. Um, and so that's really kind of the the basis of, of our stance. You know, we don't think it's sinful to take the vaccine, although it can be sinful for some people. Mm-hmm. If they do believe it's sinful, it is sinful for them. Uh, for some people, we think it's it would be wise for them to take the vaccine if that's if that's their the, the decision that they've made for their um, where they are in their life right now. Mm-hmm. Um, and so, yeah, we have people in our congregation who are facing uh, mandates from their employers. Uh, some work for the federal government, uh, some work for private companies and have just kind of been stuck and been in a bind. And so our, our desire is to help them with that. Yeah. So are you guys doing that too, James, with uh, members that are seeking religious exemptions? Yeah, we have done that. Um, we, we recently developed sort of a, a direction that we've given to our people that, that's a little bit more uh, robust than just a quick request for an exemption, give them a, an exemption mm-hmm. and move forward. There's, um, 
you know, there's two issues at play here. On the one hand, on, a, on the legal side of it, our Supreme Court of Canada has ruled in a in a, a case in times past that um, that a person's beliefs are essentially their beliefs, right. that they don't need someone to validate their beliefs. <laughs> mm-hmm. And and so it's sort of a, a strange thing, in my estimation, for me to have to actually sign off on somebody else's mm-hmm. conviction you know, so I don't mind validating, yes, this is their conviction, but we've actually now directed our people to to try and go it on their own. Mm. And so, you know, initially, you know, say no, you know, and then and then if they want something, write the letter yourself. And and we've got templates they can use and, and different letters that have already been written that they can they can lean on and uh, and just try and go it on their own without needing you know, the validation right. of, of one of us to, to be able to, to, to say, yes, this is their religious conviction. Um, the, I think the whole idea behind the religious exemption, at least in Canada, it would seem, is that they almost want there to be like a codified, even creedal stance as it relates to the vaccine in order to be able to get that yeah. exemption mm-hmm. versus Romans 14 and conscience uh, being the thing that determines whether or not a person can do that. And so they almost want like a corporate, a corporate creedal position on this thing. And, and we don't have a corporate mm-hmm. creedal position on vaccines. So anyway, we, we're encouraging them to, to, to go the process on their own uh, as long as they can. And if they get to the point where they, they, they literally need our signature to even, you know, move forward and, and yeah, we're going to give them that signature. And, uh, and so we're, you know, we're flexible in terms of doing uh, what what our people are are asking of us and what they need, but we just we want them to try and stand on their own two feet in this and and not uh, and, and allow their own personal belief and conviction to be the the driving force behind their their rejection of the vaccine. Yeah, I was talking to a pastor just recently, and uh, they've taken the same approach in their eldership as well. They've got some lawyers who have actually dealt with these issues uh, in their church, and uh, one of those attorneys has said this is that's the better way to do it because our Supreme Court has also ruled that your belief is your belief. You don't have to justify it. it doesn't have to be Christianity. It is between you and whatever. And what they have counseled people is, is, look, don't talk to HR. Don't fill out the forms, the forms that the company asks you to fill out for religious exemption. Just tell them, no, that you have a, a, a conscientious objection to this and put the burden on them. Make them fire you or make them discipline you. Yeah. And at that point, then you've got legal standing to uh, act to seek mm. the kind of protection that the law provides, and that was that was fascinating. I have I've just begun to think about that, but I, I think that makes good sense, and mm-hmm. we probably need to investigate that a little more. Um, James, I'm interested. You know, you say your your church over the past two years has <laughs> has just about doubled in size, and so obviously there's some great outreach to the community going on in the midst of everything that your church has gone through. Um, and, and, you know, we're familiar with the way, the unjust ways, uh, at least your provincial government has, has treated you. But I, I'm curious about the, the broader community there that you guys live in. You know, how is the, how is the populace there uh, dealing with some of these uh, draconian measures from the government? And how have they responded to you and your desire to keep your doors open? Yeah, you know, I would say that we're seeing this time around in our province, um, a little bit of a different climate than the first time around. So even with like mask mandates going into a store, for example, uh, you can go into a store and just, you know, not wear the mask and you're not getting hassled. So though Mm. the majority of people are wearing them, if you don't wear one, neither from, you know, other customers or from the, the, the staff of that uh, location, there's less pressure. There's less um, confrontation around masks. So the the climate's just a little bit different. And I would say, you know, like right now, we're meeting our parking lots full. Right next to us is this uh, corn maze. That's a, a huge <laughs> draw of attention <laughs> in the fall. And uh, and so their, their parking lot's packed. And so you've got these two, you know, parking lots that are, parking lots that are just packed. And, and last year, we would have people, and I say last year, last ministry year, we would have people, 
you know, uh, driving through our parking lot and taking photos or driving past mm-hmm. and taking photos. And, and there was a lot more vitriol that was, was taking place at mm-hmm. that point in time. That doesn't seem to be the case now. So I don't know if people are just going like, Oh, that's just at church, you know? And, uh, and, and, and they're just not really paying attention to us anymore. Um, mm-hmm. or if people are actually just the resistance is growing. Mm-hmm. Um, and, and I see that, I see that, in our own country um there's there's definitely resistance that's mounting i can see it in your country there's resistance that's mounting and and it's unfortunate that that we would have to celebrate that right mm-hmm. um obviously we wouldn't celebrate every expression of it because there are times when that resistance takes place in a manner that's inappropriate but but nevertheless i mean i i, I look at the resistance and I'm, I'm i'm encouraged by it i'm glad that that people are waking up and are pushing back on this, uh, this tyranny. Yeah. Amen to that. I, I think that's well said. Um, you know, I, I know that there'll be pastors listening to this conversation once it's released and, uh, would have that thought of men, you know, if our church could double in a year, year and a half, that would be amazing. We would just praise God for that kind of, uh, expression of his favor. And that's true, but it's created a lot of challenges for you guys. I mean, as elders, as elders, what I, I appreciate what you had to say that in so many ways, the church isn't changing because you're still doing what God's called you to do. And you would do that whether you've doubled or whether you have in, uh, terms of, of the number of people coming. But having more people come, seeing more people converted, seeing more Christians being discipled and shepherded, what what are some of the particular practical challenges that uh, you guys are facing as an eldership as a result of that? Well, yeah, I mean, I think the the two service format is mm-hmm. a is a, a stretch. We don't love being in in multiple services. Um, you know, there's there's a sense in which the body feels somewhat divided yeah. in that context. Um, you know, you've got our, our, our music ministry, our, our sound booth guys that are, that are just, they got long days now on Sunday. So they're getting stretched. They need help. They need, Mm -hmm. they need other hands on deck. Um, it's a, it's a long day for, uh, myself as a, as a pastor to, to preach two services. And, and, you know, again, we don't just like have a service and then people are out and then a service in and people are out. Like there's, we're, we're, we're fellowshipping, we're, we're, we're spending time with our people, we're shepherding them in, in the foyer for hours, oftentimes after the services. So it's just a, it's just a, a long, a long day, but that's fine. I mean, we, mm-hmm. we love it. You know, I, I, I can, one of the reasons we went to two services in light of the fact that we had doubled in size is that it was just getting to be too difficult to, to shepherd on a Sunday. There's just no space, you know, we're all, yeah. Uh, elbow to elbow and and so it's actually by going to two services it's made it somewhat more feasible to have more productive conversations with a a greater number of people on a sunday for me and um but yeah you know i would say this in going into this season none of this was premeditated for us yeah. i mean we were simply trying to be faithful we were not trying to grow in number mm-hmm. uh, we were not trying to get this kind of notoriety and attention none of that that was not at all like not even a hint of that in our motivation we were simply trying to be faithful we had we didn't even have the 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 you know the ability to 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 try and perceive or anticipate what would happen to our church as a response to what we've done like we're not smart enough to even try and figure that out and um and so you know i think uh we would we would you know obviously we're just here to do the Lord's work. And if if he wants us to be the the size of church that we are, then, 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 you know, we're going to be that size and, and give him thanks for it. Having said that, I I would be much happier if churches were open and being faithful and being the church and the people that were coming to our church were actually able to stay in their own church. Look, if you've got folks and they're in churches and they're not preaching the word, well, yeah, then then they need to go somewhere where the word is being preached. But when you have churches that are preaching the word, but they're just they're just complying to these mm-hmm. ridiculous health orders um, that and, and then it, their people are coming to our church because they're not receiving the shepherd care they need there. Um, I would prefer it if, if pastors were just faithful to, to shepherd their flocks and uh, and our church was a little bit smaller. So yeah. anyway, um, you know, we we need a bigger facility. So we may do a, a a building drive at some point in time. We might have to acquire land and, and build a new building, um, and uh, you know we'll see just how the Lord would would bring that about. Um, 
but yeah, I mean, we're just going to do whatever the Lord wants us to do. Yeah. Well, that's a, that's a great problem to have, but it is a problem. I mean, all those, those blessings like that, we talk about that sometimes amongst ourselves as elders here as men, you know, look at the blessings. This is great, but it creates problems and they're real problems and you got to mm-hmm. deal with them and <laughs> trying to maintain faithfulness and not change course in mm-hmm. the midst of the blessing. Uh, so praise God for what's going on there. You know, this, the, the conference coming up in January, militant and triumphant. I mean, we chose this theme and we're trying to address the doctrine of the church for the very reason that you just articulated. Uh, there are some good churches with good elders who have been faithful, but who have been knocked off course by the governmental overreach and some of the other things that have happened over the last 18 months or so. And as a result, a lot of God's people have uh, felt disoriented because their, their, their shepherds are not shepherding them the way that they had been accustomed to when things were easier, when there were less, uh, less tyrannical governmental interference. And I think some pastors have just lost sight of what the calling is. Mm-hmm. You know, someone said recently, it's, isn't it interesting, we've got a, a generation of young pastors, church leaders who read David Platt's Radical and now are afraid to go to church, <laughs> you know? <laughs> I mean, it's, it's, we've just kind of lost our way. And so, man, we're delighted that you're coming to this. And uh, sometimes people, I've had some people ask me, militant, you think the church ought to be militant? Well, yeah, we're not talking about picking up sticks and beating people. We're not talking about that type of militancy, but in terms of the kingdom of God. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Well, it's the gates of hell will not prevail, which indicates there's to be an offensive maneuver on the part of the kingdom of God, the church of Jesus Christ. Yeah, it is. The Lord uses his body to advance his kingdom, uh, and it's clear in that text. Um, but it is interesting, I mean, the pushback that you would get from a title, Militant and Triumphant. I mean, what is the church supposed to be, cowardly and defeated? <laughs> That's right. I, I don't yeah. get it. Yeah. So, uh, James, we're looking forward to you coming and being a part of this. Um, man, what would you say to fellow pastors who perhaps have struggled or just haven't gotten their mind around these things yet, or who have looked at what you've experienced and, and said, I don't know that I could do that, and I'm not even sure it's wise, you know, to take that course. What, what would you say to your, your, your fellow brothers, your pastors that are trying to be faithful, shepherding the flock of God, and yet have just been a little bit timid and maybe in, uh, put off by uh, the challenge to stand firm in the face of a government that is saying, you shall not meet? Well, it's when you ask that question, there's a, a group of men that come to mind. Um, and it's it's a it's a bit different than the group you've just described because there are a number of pastors out there who have complied uh for the for the you know the majority of the yeah. the quote unquote pandemic and and now they're trying to bring their people back. Yeah. And now they're actually trying to leverage Hebrews 10, verse yeah. 25. And and they're they're trying to talk about the essential nature of the physical gathering. Yeah. And, and so they're trying to like woo their people back to church and, and their people just aren't coming. Yeah. And, and, and those guys, they need to realize that they need to repent. Mm. They need to repent publicly. They need to, to come to their congregations and say, we were wrong. We should not have been complying with these health orders. Right. We, we, we set aside something that is critical to your spiritual growth and development. We were disobedient to Christ. Please forgive us you need to come back and, and, and you too need to repent of how you've, you've minimized the, the, the essential nature of the corporate gathering. And, and until that happens, this, this attempt to woo people back to the church, is just going to be impotent, powerless, convictionless. Um, and it, it's going to have no effect. And so there's that group that I think needs to be addressed because we're seeing it in our own country. We've got churches that are writing these letters to their, um, to their congregations. And it's just, it's just weak and wimpy Mm -hmm. and, and, and accomplishes nothing. And they're anyway, so there's that, you know, then on, on, on the guys that are just still struggling with, you know, whether they can do something or not. Um, I think it's really important to understand that, that when you are convinced and you need to be convinced that it's right for you to meet as the people of God on the Lord's day and to, to, to come together under the means of grace, to be built up and edified and to, to worship Christ, that, um, that if you're convinced of that, then you just need to do that that one Sunday. 
Mm-hmm. You know, you, you start to try and think about, well, what's this going to look like? And what about, what about the government and what's going to happen if, and when, and everything else. And it's just, you just got to put one foot in front of the next. Mm-hmm. God gives you grace for the moment you're in. Mm-hmm. And, and so you just walk faithfully in the moment you're in. And as you know, the, the pressure comes, if it even comes. And, and as the, you know, the enforcement comes, if it even comes, you know, it's, it's going to come in accord with God's gracious providence. And he's going to give you what you need for that moment. And he's going to strengthen you in the midst of it. So you don't need to have all of the strength and courage to, to, to go into a jail cell on day one, you know, that's like day 50 and the Lord's going to build you up to that. And, and so trying to sort of perceive what the entire battle is going to require of you at the beginning uh, before the battle even takes place is, is trying to stomach way too much ahead of the time. You just need to know what the Lord would have you do today mm-hmm. and do that and, 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 and let him take care of the rest. Yeah. You know, that's a big temptation for the Christian life, isn't it? We always want tomorrow's grace today. Mm. And we think about what if I'm not sure I could stand if this happened. Well, uh, yeah, you won't know until it happens and God will give you the grace in the moment that you need it and not before. And that's, that's the life of faith. That's what it means to take God at his word, to live day by day, uh, according to what he has revealed in the power of his spirit. And, And your point, it's such a good one. You know, we're seeing articles and books, you know, now why the church is essential and you know, why, why it's important to gather as a church. Well, yes and amen, but that didn't just become true in the last two or three months. That has been true uh, for 2,000 years, and we have been knocked off course. And we've had evangelical leaders tell us, look, online church is just as valid as meeting in person. We had instructions on how to do online communion, even online baptisms. Ugh. All this nonsense that has gone on, and now then it's it's as if they hope people will forget that they said these things or they acted this way, and we really need you to come back to church now. Uh, it is a day in which we need to stand firm in rediscovering and asserting what God has called the church to be and do and how we are to function regardless of cost or consequence. And we hope that this conference, Militant and Triumphant, will be uh, something of a battle cry for that to say, let's go back to the book. Let's see what God has called us to be and do, and let's stake our claim right there and trust him to fulfill whatever good purposes he has for us at this time in the ways that he judges to be best as we seek to be faithful. Mm -hmm. So, man, glad that you're coming down here to be a part of that. James, look forward to seeing you and your family and uh, having you a part of this conference. Thanks for being with us today. Yeah, it's been a blast, guys. Thanks for having me. Yeah, Yeah. well, listen, give our greetings to your family and to your fellow elders and congregation. We pray for you guys regularly still, and we're so grateful to hear the Lord's blessings, and and we will pray that God will help you to uh, steward well those blessings with all the challenges that come with it as well. And if you've not signed up yet for the Militant Triumphant Conference, I encourage you to register now. You can go to founders.org, get more information about it, and you can uh, meet and hear from James Coates and others who will be coming for that special event.